for the first person. Yeah. So. So we have. Um, Testing. Oh, I have a confession to make. When George and Carol first called me, I, I had this great puzzle as to why in the world someone whose interest had been primarily focused on the back country of South Carolina had been invited to speak at Francis Marion Seminar the Symposium. There's uh, not much about Marion in the back country of South Carolina. Then the first thought I had, uncharitably, was that I was a cheap date. <laughs> they had had me down here before and got by without having to pay me anything, and they knew they could do it again because I'll call for free to drop of a hat about matters of South Carolina and Revolutionary War history. Then the real reason I know, because Carol and George share my view of heritage, is that in the interest of education, they wanted to make sure that all of the people who were interested in the aristocracy of the east coast of South Carolina have some inkling of what was happening in the back country. <laughs> so that is my mission. I, I will tell you, I stand in front of you uh, unrepentant historical revisionist. If, if nothing else, comes out of this talk today, I hope that you will have a little bit better feel for uh, on three scores. One is I want you to know James Williams a little bit better. Two, I want you to understand and appreciate the wonderful heritage that South Carolina has in the two engagements that happened in the South Carolina backcountry, which in my opinion were uh, extremely important, if not turning points, of the American Revolution. I know that probably everybody's got their own turning points of the American Revolution. Uh, I won't go quite that far, but I want to talk about uh, the Musgrove's Mill and King's Mountain and provide those uh, of you who may not know much about those two engagements. Uh, heighten your awareness of the role that the South Carolina militia uh, had in those two very important events. All right, James Williams, Backcountry Revolutionary, which just happens to be the title of my book. <laughs> now let's see if I'm mechanically involved. Yeah, yeah, there go. We do not have a picture or, or portrait of uh, James Williams. Uh, he died at the age of 39, at which time he called himself an old man, um, from wounds he sustained at King's Mountain. So he didn't live long enough to have any kind of a post-war reputation, and he lived in the wrong part of the, of the uh, state to have somebody come around and volunteer to paint his portrait. But I think Dan Nance has captured as good a picture as I can conjure up mentally of what I think James Williams looked like as a backcountry colonel headed to an engagement um, along with one of his militiamen and in my view this is Joseph Hayes his uh, uh, James Williams best friend okay this is probably too small for uh, many of you to be able to see or read I have a Little, uh, a few copies of a handout of this, but this sort of takes you through the, the timetable of the significant events in Williams' life. Williams was born in 1740 in Hanover County, Virginia, which happens to be the same county that Thomas Sumter was born in eight years earlier. And there's no indication that they knew each other at that time. William's father moved to Granville County, North Carolina, and was a very significant landholder there and in the nearby counties of North Carolina, Virginia, uh, including Halifax County. 
he left Williams an 800 acre uh, tobacco plantation in Halifax County, Virginia. Um, Williams, I am convinced, but I have no documentary evidence of this, must have come down as a young man, an adventurer, and participated in the 1759 and 60 Indian campaigns that the British mounted against the Cherokees. The, why do I say that? That he came down, why do I think he came down to this neck of the woods? It's because when he does move to the Little River area near 96 of South Carolina in what in in 1773 uh, and he runs for office in the first provincial legislative uh, Congress of South Carolina in 1775 he's elected and my guess is that he had to have some sort of a reputation some people in this neck of the woods must have known him uh, prior to that to that time uh, so that coupled with the uh, idea that he was a 19 by in 1759 he would have been a 19 year old young man adventuresome looking for adventure and he found it i think in the Cherokee Indian campaigns of that era. All right, so the uh, war breaks out in uh, South Carolina. He is elected, as I say, to the first provincial Congress uh, or legislature of South Carolina. And he very importantly is put on the committee to regulate the militia which I think is a very significant uh, aspect of his life because it puts him in the position of trying to help the Whig government in its formative stage to come up with a way to legitimize their government. How are you going to do that? How are you going to have a legitimate government without a police force? And what's your police force in the colonial era? Your police force is your militia and Williams is accorded the very great honor, I believe, of being uh, named uh, to that committee to regulate the militia. So I was named to that commission, to that committee, uh, but James Williams was. James Williams, as will be a recurrent theme in my talk, Williams and Sumter uh, rarely agreed on anything. So. Uh, the conflict between those two men play a significant role in shaping the story of James Williams. But moving along, Williams participates early in the uh, first battle of 96, the snow campaign. He raises a company uh, in the Little River area of militia, and he's a captain at that time. By the Indian campaign of July 1776, he's a, he's a lieutenant colonel in the South Carolina militia. He's head of the Little River Regiment of uh, militia at that time. There are a number of the pension statements in which his men who served under him attribute to him service not only in those early campaigns, as I just said, uh, including Lindley's Ford, but also in the Florida campaign, or the third of the, of the various disastrous Florida campaigns, and uh, the siege of Savannah. The, one man, although I believe this is just totally wrong, says that he was at Briar Creek with uh, Nash when, when he was defeated at, uh, I mean, Ash, when he was defeated at uh, Friar Creek. I got no indication that that's right. The Battle of Stono Ferry, Siege of Savannah, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that he participated as a militiaman 
in some or all of those engagements highlights a point which I think is very significant. I think James Williams learned very early that the cooperation between Continentals and militia was not likely to end well for the militia. I think he lost confidence in the uh, ability of the Continental uh, officers to make use of the militia that they had available to them at any given engagement. <laughs> um, and that, that lesson manifests itself in setting the stage for the Battle of Musgrove's Mill. Battle of Musgrove's Mill, August the 19th, 1780. What had happened in South Carolina as of August the 8th or 19th of 1780? Camden happened in the 16, 15, 16, Fishing Creek, the 18th. But even before that, you had the fall of Charleston and the complete infestation, to use a derogatory term, of all of South Carolina by the British forces. They had set up enclaves throughout the entire state. Williams is part of what is called the refugee force of South Carolina militia, men who were unwilling to take protection from the British, who wanted to continue the fight. They couldn't do it in South Carolina. They had to leave their homes and flee, and flee to North Carolina. They fled there. Sumter comes out of retirement having been sitting on his backside in his plantation in South Carolina. Uh, after the British take Charleston, Sumter comes out, sets up a camp south of Charlotte, North Carolina, um, in Clems Creek. It is a meeting place for the refugee uh, militia. Williams shows up there uh, and co cooperates with Sumter uh, for a while. Then Here's my analysis on Musgrove's Mill. Horatio Gates is the commander of the Southern Department of the Continental Army in August of 1780. He's formulated this idea he's going to confront Cornwallis in Canton. He sends Sumter a letter uh, asking Sumter to cooperate with him not to join forces with him, but to protect his flank. Sumter agrees to that. Uh, Gates goes even a little further. He detaches one uh, detachment of Continentals to join Sumter in protecting Gates's left flank. Oh, uh, right, yeah, left flank. Uh, Williams has a different idea. Williams and the men who choose to go with him are sitting at General Charles McDowell's camp on Broad River. When they hear that there's a big congregation of Tories at Musgrove's Mill coming together to join Patrick Ferguson's force. Ferguson has been appointed, I guess is the right word, by the English to raise the Tory militia in South Carolina, rally them to the British cause, to organize them. Ferguson is out beating the bushes to raise those loyalists, to, to get them to join his forces. He, uh, Williams, hears that there are 200 Tories congregated at Musgrove's Mill. He's with General Charles McDowell. Also with McDowell, John, uh, Isaac Shelby, and, uh, and uh, Elijah Clark, a Georgian and a North Carolina uh, over-mountain man. 
Shelby's an open mouth man. They joined forces, and according to Williams' official report, written very shortly after the Musgrove's Mill engagement, 200 men leave McDowell's camp and go to Musgrove's Mill. This is, a, this is the battle site, just to, order, to get you oriented. Musgrove Mill down here on the Ennery River. The state park is roughly this area here. Because of recent archaeology, we now know that the Battle Ridge was about two miles further up the existing road. Currently, about where Avenger Road is, there was a ridge where the uh, the uh, Whig forces set up Shelby, Williams, and Clark. Based on using the resources available to me, and I realize there may be some uh, room for argument in this, I believe the, uh, I've come to believe that the allocation of men at Musgrove's Mill was roughly 120 under Williams, 40 under Shelby, and 40 under Clark. Uh, be that as it may, whatever the allocation is, William's in the middle. So I'm thinking he's got to have the largest force at least because that way, stationed in the middle, he can pr protect both of his flanks uh, if, if they get compromised. They arrive at Musgrove Mill only to find out that rather than 200 Tories there, the night before they arrived, another 150 to 200 provincial uh, soldiers. Those are Americans who have been trained and inducted into the British Army. So these are British Raiders, have arrived at Musgrove's Mill the night before. Their horses, they've ridden all night to get to, to uh, Musgrove's Mill. Their horses are exhausted. They cannot turn around and retreat in the face of a much bigger force. They come up, their presence has been discovered. They come up with a scheme of sending Shadrach Inman with about 20 horsemen down to the Tory campsite. Yell at them, scream at them, see if they can get them to engage and come up and meet the uh, Whigs who have arranged themselves, arranged themselves as I've shown up there. And sure enough, that's what happens. They, they do come up and lo and behold, the Whigs basically mow down the, uh, the Tories and the Provincials. It is a one-sided battle. The, is a uh, no way that the Whigs are going to be able to keep the ground, uh, but what they could do is in their orderly retreat from this location, take about 70 prisoners with them. They do take 70 prisoners. They kill probably on the order of, of the same number of, of uh, men are killed as are taken prisoner but killed or seriously wounded. They take those uh, men back up towards McDowell's camp in North Carolina. Shelby decides he's going home and Clark decides he'll, he wants to uh, rally his men in North Carolina, see if he can bring his men back together. They give the prisoners to Williams. Williams takes them to Hillsboro where John Rutledge the governor in exile of South Carolina is sitting. He delivers, and where Horatio Gates has retreated to after the disaster of Camden. Um, Williams delivers the 70 prisoners. He makes a pitch to Rutledge and to the North Carolina Board of War. Give me some money, let me recruit. I want to go hunt down Patrick Ferguson. Why would Williams want to hunt down Patrick Ferguson? June the 15th, take you back in time a little while. June the 15th, 1780. Who comes into Williams' 
3,600 acre plantation in Lawrence County, South Carolina, with Lawrence County, then it was 96. But Patrick Ferguson occupies Williams Plantation, dispossesses Williams family. Uh, Chris and I were joking before the talk that uh, she said that uh, in her view, Ferguson put Williams family under house arrest. I said, no, it was more like outhouse arrest because they were dispossessed, according to Mrs. Williams, they were dispossessed from their own house by, by uh, Patrick Ferguson, who at that time had also in his uh, forces uh, Thomas Brown, Burnt Foot Brown, had also occupied Williams Plantation. Okay, so Williams making the pitch. I want to hunt down. I want to hunt down Ferguson. He makes the pitch. He gets twenty-five thousand dollars from the North Carolina Board of War and a license to recruit in North Carolina. He gets five thousand dollars from Governor Rutledge to recruit men. He does, in fact, go into Caswell County, where his brother is then living and recruits two companies of men from Caswell County to join him. And I'm positive there were others. In fact, I've, I've, based on the pension applications, I had 10 pensioners who served under William Graham, and two of the 10, uh, and arguably a third, basically say they were on their way to take on uh, Ferguson when they ran into Williams and fell under his command. So I think and, and you have to know that, that Graham left the, uh, his company. His wife became very ill. He got news of that the night before uh, Kings Mountain. And Graham leaves the encampment and is no longer there. So his men are looking for higher leadership. So I'm convinced they, they fell under Williams. So you have Williams now having recruited men from Casual County and some other North Carolinians, and also picked up all of his refugee buddies that have come into North Carolina for refuge as well. A large number of them. This is, this is just a brief aside. This is a, a part of a pension statement that Samuel Hammond filed, who uh, was part of Williams Troop. And this is a recruiting uh, uh, poster that he, he had made up to encourage men to sign up for this chase to, to capture Ferguson. He's saying, come and uh, we'll give you beef, bread, and potatoes. And uh, you sign up and we'll, we'll go get Ferguson. All right. So, here's, here's part of the revisionist in addition to redeeming Williams' uh, reputation. Uh, part of the revision is that the Battle of Kings Mountain is almost exclusively celebrated as the achievement of the so-called over-mountain men. Almost nothing is said about the South Carolina or North Carolina militia participation in the Battle of Kings Mountain. So I have try to, best I can, using all the resources that I can put together, come up with how I think the various units came together. This is the, South, this is the composition of the South Carolina units under Williams, and, this is the, and, and here are the North Carolina units that I think are under Williams. I have yet to actually put uh, Graham and his men under Williams, but I believe they were. All right, here we come to what was the troop deployment at Kings Mountain. We have a number of accounts that say the number of men who actually fought the Battle of Kings Mountain was roughly uh, 900 or 915 is the, the number that I had used based on various and sundry sources. Who had who under what command at that time? Well, there's a general consensus that the, the colonels had met at Calpins and decided that since Campbell was the oldest uh, 
officer there, he would take, quote, command for the day. There was no agreement that he was, quote, unquote, in overall uh, command. This is, I guess, in keeping with Dave's presentation, is uh, jealousy in rank. Uh, I don't think any of these men uh, count out to, uh, to uh, Campbell and said, you know, whatever you say goes. They deploy around, they, they catch Ferguson at the top of Kings Mountain. They deploy around in their various numbers. And here's how I would break it down. Campbell, Chronicle, uh, Chandler, who's a Georgian. Uh, Elijah Clark was not at Kings Mountain. Uh, he, his men uh, were under the command of, of one of his uh, captains, Cameron, and uh, Benjamin Cleveland, Joseph McDowell, not uh, Charles, uh, Severe, Shelby, uh, Lacey, Williams, and uh, Winston. Uh, I'm not naive enough to think that the men who were loyal to Thomas Sumter uh, would have willingly come under James Williams' command. I believe that the South Carolina units were in fact bifurcated between Williams and those who were loyal to Sumter and, and uh, his side, primarily Edward Lacey. Uh, they had, they, I just simply don't believe they would have come under Williams' command, would have willingly come under Williams' command there. So that gives you this sort of breakdown for the Battle of Kings Mountain. You get roughly, under my allocation, 67% are maybe who you could call legitimately over mountain men. Now personally, whoop, I'm going the wrong way. It's all right. Personally, I don't think Benjamin Cleveland belongs there. I know he met at Quaker Meadows with all of the other men from the Over Mountain area. Uh, but he was from Wilkes County. Most of his men came from present day Surrey and Stokes County, North Carolina. Those were not Over Mountain men, in my view. But out of fairness to the Over Mountain men view of things, I'll allocate those to the Over Mountain men for purposes of this talk. That leaves the South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia militias. And how do they participate? 28%, 5%, 33%. How many battles are you going to win with 67% of your men? Not very many. So that tells you the South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia militia men who were at the Battle of Kings Mountain played a very significant role in that engagement. What happened to Williams at that engagement? Williams was the highest ranking officer there to be mortally wounded. He was wounded right at the end of the battle. He died the next day, was buried on a Tories plantation as the Whigs retreated back towards Calvin's. Uh, many, many years later, a very interesting account of the DAR deciding to dig up what they thought was uh, Williams' bones and put them into the wonderful memorial to him that sits in front of what was at the time the uh, Carnegie Library in Gaffney, South Carolina, but is now the admin building of that, of that of Cherokee County. Uh, but there's a wonderful monument there to Williams, which is depicted there. Uh, Williams dies. His bones are theoretically dug up and put at this memorial. In addition to his having given his life for the cause, uh, his two eldest sons also died in this war. Uh, they were hung in November of 1781 at Hayes Station along with uh, the man who succeeded Williams as commander of the Little River Regiment of Militia, Joseph Hayes. Uh, they were surrounded by uh, Bloody Bill Cunningham, and once, when they surrendered, 
under Cunningham's assurance that they would be treated as prisoners of war, uh, he summarily uh, hung all, all of the real hard-nosed uh, Williams that he caught there, including Williams' two sons. Williams was celebrated after the Battle of Kings Mountain as, quote, the hero of Kings Mountain. Of course, he was no such thing, but he was a hero of Kings Mountain. There was a song, and this is one of the appendices of my book, is a song that was made up that celebrated Williams' victory at Kings Mountain. He was highly regarded until 1814 when Colonel William Hill, uh, a Sumter uh, protege, if you will, wrote a memoir in which he attacked Williams as probably the scourge of the earth and the man who was responsible for Sumter not being at the significant battle of Kings Mountain. Uh, Sumter was, in fact, not at the battle of Kings Mountain because he was up in Hillsboro lobbying John Rutledge for promotion to general. At that time, in October of 1780, Thomas Sumter had no official role or rank in the South Carolina militia. He had been quote unquote elected as the general by the men in the uh, camp at Clems Creek. But he had no legitimate stamp of authority as to his role. He got that on October the 8th, the day after the Battle of Kings Mountain, from John Rutledge, who writes a letter that day saying, I've sent Sumter and Williams out. He doesn't know at that time, Rutledge does not know at that time that Williams is dead. I've sent Williams and Sumter out. They'll never agree on a damn thing, but between them, they're two rascally guys and we'll get some things done. Unfortunately, James Williams didn't live long enough to achieve the kind of notoriety that William, that uh, Sumter did. I am absolutely convinced that had William survived, he would have then had two feathers in his cap that Sumter did not have. He would have had the victory at Musgrove's Mill, and he would have had the wonderful victory at Kings Mountain, which I really, I'm, I'm assuming, the audience knows its place in history, and I, but I could give a very quick background for that if need be. But that victory at Kings Mountain was without any doubt in my mind the main reason that the war in the South ended up being fought the way it was fought. Cornwallis was sitting at the juncture of trade and Tryon in Charlotte, North Carolina with the main body of his army in late September, early October of 1780 with the idea I've conquered South Carolina, I'm going into North Carolina, I'm going to do the same to North Carolina. He hears that he's lost his entire left flank when all of Ferguson's men are lost at Kings Mountain, either taken prisoner or killed. He has to retreat to Winsboro, where he licks his wounds. And George Washington, for the first time in the history of the Continental Congress, gets the authority to appoint the commander of the Southern Department of the Continental Army. And he has the good sense to relieve Horatio Gates of that command and put his very good friend and trusted former commissary Nathaniel Green into that role. And as they say, the rest is history. Thank you. Did I use up too much of my time or not? Oh, you still got time. Did anybody want to ask any questions? Yeah, David. Uh, you mentioned that Rutledge wrote the letter about basically the after supper, after giving supper his commission. 
was the, was Suffrage Commission then, and Williams Commission dated the same then? That was her. Well, William. Williams was first. <laughs> You are, well, the question is, was Williams Commission and uh, uh, Sumter's Commission dated the same when, when uh, Rutledge made Sumter the general in October of 1780? <laughs> There's no short answer to that, Dave. I'm not convinced, notwithstanding that William Hill's memoir says that, that Rutledge had made uh, Williams a general, I've never found that. There are several roadblocks to that. One is that somebody as dedicated as you has not taken up the, the role of, of gathering and translating, and transcribing all of Rutledge's correspondence. But there's a very good reason for that. You ever read his writing? Yeah, that's what I was getting ready to say. There's a very good reason why it was, the one, one that, is, that correspondence is spread to the four winds. Two, the handwriting, and I've, my, my primary role is to, uh, has been since July of 2006, the creation of a database of all of the pension applications that men who live long enough to file them, did uh, went, transcribe them and put them into a searchable database, uh, free and uh, fully searchable, as I say, uh, on the web. and. Uh, so I've got some experience in reading handwriting. Life is too damn short to try to decipher uh, Rutledge's handwriting. It, it is unbelievable. Uh, so I'm sure that's a great term. But I've not found anything that confirms that Rutledge. What I, what, if, you, if you put a pistol to my head and said, okay, well, you've got to guess what happened. Why does, why does He'll say in his memoir that Williams came into camp where Sumter was before Kings Mountain and say that he was the general and he had command. I think what really happened is Williams went to Hillsborough, made his pitch to the Board of War in North Carolina and the Rutledge. Rutledge says to him, you go beat uh, Ferguson and you're, you're going to be the general of the backcountry militia. Bear in mind, we're getting into a lot of specific detail here, but, but the, it's, it's important to know that once the uh, Charleston fell in May of 1780, the backcountry militia was basically leaderless. The commander of the backcountry militia prior to that date was a man by the name of Andrew Williamson. Andrew Williamson's two lieutenants, Leroy Hammond, his brother-in-law, Williamson's brother-in-law, and a guy by the name of Andrew Pickett. All three of them took protection from the British and agreed to lay down their arms and fight no more. And Williamson thereby created a void. There was no commander. I am absolutely positive Williams made the pitch, made me the commander. Here I've led the people into Musgrove's mill, made me the commander. I've got a legitimate claim to it. I think what Rutley said to him is, you go beat Ferguson and we'll talk. Because I can't find that magic bullet that says he actually was. Now the British, in their accounts of the Battle of Kings Mountain, claimed they killed General James Williams. Well, you think that anybody's going to claim it in, in an in a, uh, engagement where they got soundly defeated that at least they killed the head man of the opposite side. Uh, I, I don't know on what basis uh, Allery says that uh, Williams is the general. I mean, it's theoretically possible, I guess, that Williams did, as Hill says, he had his commission on his body, and that once he was dead, some one of the Tories picked it out of his pocket or something. I, I, you know, if that's true, it's never shown up, and I, I've, not, I've not seen any core evidence of that promotion. Now, just to finish the story, so as not to besmirch the reputation of Leroy Hammond and 
Andrew Pickens, the British were so stupid as to uh, invade their plantations, sack them, uh, and Pickens, being the honorable man that he was, uh, viewed that as a violation of his parole and, and freed him from it. So he came back into an active role, as did Leroy Hammond. Uh, Williamson never did. As in an active role, but there's plenty of evidence that once he moved from the back country into Charleston under British protection, he was actually feeding intelligence as to the British troops to uh, John Lawrence's, uh, no, to, to, to uh, Colonel John Lawrence, Henry Lawrence's son, as to what the British were up to. Uh, so in a way, when even Williamson came back into the action. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Notwithstanding all of our wonderful uh, tours, books, projects, uh, preservation of sites, this man's work was recognized a couple of years ago by the South Carolina legislature. He's in the tens of thousands of, of Revolutionary War pension applications. So what that means is even the, the best of authors now, the bar has been raised because unless they've done the research using his database, then you haven't done a book that meets the test of the Southern campaign. So to Will Graves, hit it! The question is, what, talk a little bit more about the bones of Williams. Uh, what they did is they took the, the historical records and they figured out where they thought they were buried. This is in, this is in 19, the early 1900s, I think, 1909, don't hold me to that. Uh, they went out to dig them up. Uh, they dig, dig them up. They had no place to put them. They put them in a tow sack. This is the only newspaper article that's in the appendix of my book, which tells this wonderful history. They put them in a tow sack, put them under the counter of a hardware store where the cats slept on them for a couple of years. Uh, and then once, once the memorial was done, the, uh, the bones were then the cat lost its resting place. <laughs> it was much bemoaned, but unlike the Egyptians, they did not bury the cat with the general cat. He had rest assured. There's no cat bones. I'd love to have uh, the, the DNA from those bones, because today we would know whether they are in fact. But how are you going to know a hundred, let's see, that would be roughly 175 years after the event, how do you want to know that what you've actually dug up James Williams' and bones? There's nobody alive that was there when they buried them. Anything else? Thank you so much. I appreciate your attention.